Good day and welcome to A Place Call Through. We're broadcasting live from WYTV7 Community Broadcasters Network. I am Patricia Wade Goings, the host of A Place Call Through. I am an evangelist. I am a life coach. I am a health and wellness coach. I am also the author of Willpower, The Call to Rise Above. And you know, here at WYTV7 Community Broadcasters Network, we share stories and testimonies of Mission of Hope. We share stories empowering others globally. But you know what? It's only done because of your charitable giving. So we ask that you continue to give. Sow those seeds to help us continue to go globally. We want to share those stories and help someone else that's going through to get through to where they need to be to, to be to destiny. And again, I thank you for giving and invite you to sow that seed at WYTV7.org. Today, we are honored to have as our guest, all the way from California, we're welcoming to a place called through, none other than the Dr. Jameson, who will give his story of sexual abuse, the abuse, the drug addiction that happened in his family. And you know, the sad thing is that even though we're in a state of pandemic, you know, substance abuse, you know, abuse overall is just on the rise today. It just seems like everything is just increasing, increasing, increasing. And, you know, amongst youth, they are abused. They become victims as well. And they have to hide in the shame, trying to keep these secrets, you know, from their parents or people who guard after them. They don't want anyone to know that they are being abused or they become victims of violent acts. So today, again, we're going to hear from Dr. Jameson, who's going to give you his story of how he survived the storm. Welcome to A Place Called Through, Dr. Jameson. Well, thank you for having me today. It's an honor to be on the show, hopefully to display some information where the general public can embrace, as well as utilize as a tool to condition their behavior as they continue to go through any storm that they have uh, endured. Again, we do thank you and welcome you. And we want to begin your story today because we know that your childhood was one of the rockiest times in your life. And we are ever thankful that you have survived what you have survived to become the successful doctor that you are now. But we want to take our listeners and our viewers to a place that you have gone through in your early childhood. Tell us how life was for you growing up. Well, you know, first and foremost, uh, I'm grateful to be here today. Uh, Say by the grace of God, I'm a God-fearing Christian man that actually give all the praises to him for bringing me through such a difficult process as a kid. Uh, I wasn't sexual abused, but I was child abused as a kid uh, because I come from a domestic violence family where my stepfather was a drug addict. And my stepfather was a drug addict to the point where it affected him Mentally, it's one as part of one of his behavior. When I say one of his behavior, because when he's not on drugs, he's one of the nicest men on earth. Literally, you can he give you the clothes off his back when he's not on drugs. As a kid at the age of six years old, I was going through so much watching my mother go through the beatings and all the torture and all the brutal things that he was doing to her, and it kind of affected me as a kid on the mental side, because I was a mama's boy and I was painful to see, it was painful for me to see her go through so much as a kid and where we both was defenseless. So, you know, as I went through the process and was into the elementary stage part of school in my life, I never thought that a kid would have to endure so much pain for being intelligent or smart at an early age. Going through my grade school period when I received it, you know, made it to the sixth grade, getting ready to go to middle school, which it was junior high school back at that time. Um, I was A and B student and literally I was like, I, I think in spelling bees, I was one of the smartest students in school at that time. Um, but throughout the whole process from the age of five, six to 10 years old, I was just, my mom just got beat up almost every day. And, and it, it bothers me for the simple fact that every time she got into an altercation with him and he beat her up, 
whether she's hospitalized or or whether she's confined to the home, afraid to go out or go to work because of the bruises and all the things that was, you know, that she had uh, endured from the fight. She will always leave and go back to him. And mm -hmm. that's what I couldn't understand. That time frame of leaving him and he'll beg her back and bait her back in. We'd be gone for about three or four weeks, maybe to a month. But as a kid, we don't understand why you go back. Why these fights continue to happen for the simple fact that we like that fly on the wall. We don't know exactly what's going on with the doors closed, you know? So as a, you know, as I started getting older and I started digging into it and, 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 and interrogating her about why do we keep going back and forth after he do us so bad, his daughter was his biological kid. I was the step kid. So therefore I had to take the abuse and the beating for her actions and my bad actions too, if I did anything wrong. On top of that, I had to take the abuse of my mother action after he beat her up. And when she go to work, he'll take his anger out on me for whatever his daughter might do with us being kids as I was always the troublemaker. So, so therefore I had to deal with my education level, going to school, being smart, not saying I was smarter than she was, but I was older than she was. So I was pretty much like, should have been like that big brother to her. But as I brought those A's and B's home from school, you would think a parent would be happy. You know, you get your allowances, you know, for being smart, your A's and B's and be encouraged me to go to school. Well, doggone it. I was afraid to make an A or B because I knew if I did that, it was going to be torture. So make the long story short to get down to the, to, to the bit of the butter. I came home one evening with that report card. And lo and behold, the man beat me from pillar to post. He beat me so bad that the next day I went to school, I couldn't sit down because my butt was shredded like snake skin. He beat me with a scrub brush, you know, that you, you know, take a bath with. One of those big brushes. Then on top of that, I mean, he beat me in my chest so bad where could, I could have had a heart attack that went into a cardiac arrest because of the anxiety and the fear of getting beat. Uh, mom came home a couple of weeks after that incident because I was, you know, he was incarcerated for child abuse, of course. But we we got on a road to where we were trying to make a move to get out of the house before he was able to get out of jail. During that span of that time he was incarcerated, we was able to move with my aunt over in North Memphis. That's where we're from, Memphis. And we stayed with her until mom applied for housing through the Memphis Housing Authority. That led us from the relationship and the marriage with him to a project lifestyle of living. Okay, so now we fast forward from the age of 10 to the age of 12. Once I got into the project at the age of 12, I was just starting junior high school in the seventh grade. We left one project over in Hirsch Village in North Memphis where my auntie housed us for several months until mom got approved for her own apartment. And then we moved to Lamar Terrace. That's the project that I was basically grew up in from the age of 12 until I became a teenager in high school and graduated. But um, lo and behold, when he got out of jail, we thought the battle was over between him and her. He came out looking for her because now that I'm a teenager, she was able to sit me down and say, well, I had to go through that process because he was threatening to kill us if I didn't come back. She didn't have a brother to defend her. Her mom and dad stayed out of the business because they was married. So that just left her and myself and his daughter living together. And she's fearful for her life because she's intimidated and she's manipulated. Mm -hmm. Okay, so therefore, the abuse never stopped with us. But the daughter was always able to be daddy's little girl, the princess. Of course, yeah, she was the innocent one. But I want yeah. to go back a little bit earlier before the transitioning, you know, began to happen. Because I noted when I spoke to you before, there was something significant that your stepfather attempted to do to you 
Um, and your mom kind of just happened to be there and broke that before it was able to happen to you. Um, because of his addiction, as you stated, mentally, you know, he was altogether a different person when, you know, he wasn't abusing the drugs. So as you growing up sixth and seventh grade, there were some significant things going on for you, as you stated, trying to process why, who, you know, how come, what did I do wrong? And as, you know, we stated earlier, a lot of times when children are, you know, they're being abused and they're forced into situations, it, it's silent. They hide it out of fear and often shame to let somebody know, you know, my dad, my mom is abusing me or making me do drugs, this, that, and the other. His habits, how were they inflicted upon you and your siblings? His habits was inflicted on me because um, while he was injecting himself with heroin at one point in time, he was in the bathroom. He was out, that was his secret place to go and, you know, and inject himself to the bathroom. That particular day, he didn't, he didn't lock the door. I was going to the restroom to take a pee pee <laughs> and walked in. He was sitting on the toilet with the tourniquet around his arm. And the needle, he was injecting the heroin into his arm. So when I walked in, I tried to bag out because I was I knew I was in a, a, a place where I shouldn't be because yeah, every kid is afraid of needles. So, you know, I want to get out of his <laughs> way and let him do a thing. And nevertheless, you know, as I got ready to walk back out the door, he pulled me by the back of my shirt and snatched me back into the bathroom. He threatened and said, don't you tell nobody, don't you tell nobody, you know. And I mean, I didn't know what he was talking about telling about it because at that age, I couldn't determine whether he was giving himself a shot to be healed or whether he was injecting drugs. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I can hear in his voice when he asked me, you want to go on this ride with me? I'm like, you know, kid, you think you finna go on a ride? You finna crank up and go mm -hmm. somewhere, you know? And I said, yeah, you know, and innocent, yes. And, uh, and I was scared at the same time, so I wasn't going to say no. Mm -hmm. But, you know when he started to straddle me and tie the tourniquet around my arm and, you know, I was in frantic and I was panicking, I was fighting, I was kicking, I was doing everything that I could possibly do to avoid him from tying that tourniquet on my arm because a kid is always afraid of needles. Mm -hmm. Just so ironic, my mom was getting all work. After he got the tourniquet on my arm, I was still squirming around. You know, sometimes when you give a kid a shot, it takes three or four people to hold you down. That's just, you at your strongest point. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, when he put his legs around my waist and had my arm stretched out with the tunic on it, as he had the needle in his arm, getting ready to pierce my skin with the injection, that's when mom came in. What the, you know, going on in here, mm -hmm. yada, 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 because he didn't lock the door behind me, you know, because he assumed that we was going to be home together because his daughter sure? was up in, the lit, up in the front room. So she wasn't gonna come in to protect me because she's two years younger than I am. So she's scared, uh -huh. you know, she's innocent. But long story short, mom popped in on him and before he was able to get that injection of heroin, I praise God that she did. Um, he beat her up again. And as I tried to help fight him and, and you know, with her, he was just tossing us around like we was just a step kid. You know, he, he really beat us up pretty bad at that time. But mom, mom went through so much abuse because he was not physically beating him with a fist, but he would get an object, form an object like hammers, bats, sticks, you know, stitching cords. I mean, like literally treating her like she was his kid. He became kid. very physically yeah. violent. Oh, very you know, much. oh, literally when he pulled a shotgun on her, you know, like literally pulled a double barrel shotgun in the face and told her that she was, he was going to kill her. I jumped on his back to try to intercept that and, and beat him. From back, he just lived there, picked me off his back and throw me across the, the room because I was a kid. These are some things that I used to dream about at nighttime as I got older because I used to be so fearful of him killing her. So after that incident, my grandfather stepped in. My aunt, my grandmother Susie stepped in, told mother, said, if you don't leave this man, your son is going to kill him or he's going to kill your son. Okay, I want you to stay right there with that point because we're going to take a quick commercial break and then we'll come back to get the rest of your story and your testimony here at A Place Call Through Broadcasting from WYTV7 Community Broadcasters Network. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after commercial break. 
80% of women will develop a pelvic health condition at some point in their lives. There is relief. There is hope. The Pelvic Floor Store, your resource for personal health. Welcome back to A Place Called Through, broadcasting from WITV7, Community Broadcasters Network. I'm your host, Patricia Wade Goings. This afternoon, we have this honor of speaking with Dr. Jameson, who has been sharing with us through his early childhood life that he's gone through so much abuse as he's even watched his mom being abused. And as a child trying to find a way to escape, it is only by the grace of God and that later on that he has been led to do greater things and give back to his community because of the things that happened with a stepfather who was addicted to drugs and his mom and his siblings lived in fear day to day, but he is a survivor and he will continue with us now to share with how he got through where his stepfather actually tried to inject him with heroin, but his mom walked in just in the nick of time. Even though she was abused, she still stood up as a mom. So we want to continue with him and talk on to how he moved on, how him and his family were able to pick up the pieces and move on to a new day. Dr. Jameson, if you will continue with us at that point, that after you went through this and you know you, you were in school and as you said, you had been beaten so badly. I know that you said that you were sent to the nurse's office that day because you couldn't even sit down because of the bruises that you endured. So take us to that point now that you know, you've gotten past this, where are you with your family now? Well, basically I got past that point and um, it encouraged me and empowered me to basically become the advocate for people and children that go through some of the same things similar to what I went through. And I feel that my testimony and some of the things that I endured at that time would be positive, a positive tool for someone who's going through domestic violence relationship, kids are being child abused, even sexual abused. Um, it put me on a path that I would not ever want to see a kid be fearful of telling someone that they are going through so much because nobody knows what goes on behind closed doors. The doors are closed but the world is still open. Like me, I was able to go to school that day and couldn't sit down. That gave me an opportunity to let the teacher know, the guidance counselor and the principal know that I was being beaten and I was fearful for not only my life, but my mother life. Um, growing up in Lamar Terrace, it gave me an opportunity to become a mature man because I grew up surrounded by guys that were doing drugs. They were smoking weed, were shooting heroin, were popping pills. That was a reflection back to me growing up. So that gave me enough sense not to endure with those type kind of situations because I know what the drugs would do to you. Because keep in mind, as long as my stepfather wasn't doing the drugs, he was one of the nicest people on earth. Uh -huh. So my friends and I in junior high school, most kids get together. We smoked our little marijuana. We did our little drinking, our beer and wine and stuff like that, and hanging out at the, you know, at the sock hops and you know some of the school events and sneaking and doing things behind your parents' back. But the most painful thing happened to me at the age in my teenage days. It's when I went home one day, and I was like a um, senior in high school, still in the project, hadn't graduated yet. But I started working at the age of 14 years old. That put me on a path of stability. That put me on a, on, on a path of entrepreneurship. That put me on a path to look back and say, well, mom took care of me when I was a kid where I couldn't take care of myself. So now it's time for me to start giving back to her. So I got me a job picking up paper in the park at the age of 14 years old, which is one of those summer jobs. Mm -hmm. I used to give mom my entire check and, mm -hmm. and she would give me money to go to school, but she was able to go and buy my clothes. So that put me on the independency road, knowing that I'm able to contribute, to pay bills, and then take care of myself at the same time. After that summer job was over, I got a job working in a restaurant called Captain Bilbo that I was shucking oysters at the age of 15 years old. Mm -hmm. So I've been working from the age of 14 on up to now I'm 60 years old. But the, but the beautiful part about it is I was gang related. I used marijuana as a substance, you know, not a opioid, but I never did any pill poppings, any heroin, anything like that. I was going through the phase. 
But my, the most painful thing that happened to me in my teenage days when my mom looked at me in my eyes and told me that I was not going to be nobody because of my surroundings, because of the things that I was doing. And it gave us a reflection back to how I grew up. But my you friend, also got in the gang at one yeah, point, too. I did. Yeah, I got in the gang and I got in the gang basically to help protect my mother against my stepfather because when he got out from being incarcerated after he went to jail for the child abuse and the, the abuse that he did to my mom and the domestic violence. But when he got out, he came looking for us. My mother used to work at this restaurant called Howard Johnson. She didn't have a vehicle, so she, she, did, she wasn't driving, but she used to walk to work almost every day. So how he found out where we lived at, he followed her from work without her knowing. She didn't know he was out of jail. He followed her all the way home to the projects and he found out where we lived at. He did it for about a week to just adjust the time mm -hmm. when she leave and when she get off this, that, and up to know her schedule. Mom came home one evening after work and she was at a frantic. She was so nervous. You thought we thought she was going to have a seizure because she was shaking so bad. It's because she went face to face with him again. Uh -huh. not knowing that he was out of jail and it caught her by surprise. She came home and she was crying. She was at a frantic and I was like in the gangs at that time. So when she told me the story that he threatened to kill him, if I didn't come back to kill her, if she didn't go back to him and you know, he was going to be stalking her every day until she come back. She just gave the story. So I had three older siblings that had boyfriends. It was like older than me was living with us in the project. So it wasn't my little sister, mom, and I. It was my three bigger sisters that had boyfriends that was gang related, and I was under them in, in the same gang. So the moment basically he threatened her, we set up a plot to go no to no for him because at that time I was a teenager and I wasn't afraid of anything at that time. Mm -hmm. So when she walked to work at five o'clock that morning, going to that restaurant, we was already staked out in bushes. So when he pulled up to harass her, we come out the bushes. That was the, I wouldn't tell you what else happened, but that was the last time he harassed my mother, even came near the project because he was fearful of me. Then I'm a teenager. You're, yeah, I'm not a little you're, bitty boy. You know what I mean? You're mature now. You're not this little baby boy. You're Absolutely. not defenseless. You can't Absolutely. defend now. And so that put fear in him because I had established something that he didn't have because he was alone and it was like 10 or 12 of us. And it wasn't like where we wasn't equipped with weapons. You know, I had a, I had a weapon at the age of 15, 16 years old and mom didn't even know it. But mm -hmm. it, it wasn't the, the, the process that we wanted to kill him. But if he had to touch her, we would have beat him up bad enough. He would have wished he was dead. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't do anything to harm anybody on that level, but it was just for her protection. I was in the game, not because I was manipulated to be in the game, but we just joined the game just to have, fight other neighborhoods, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, something we did back in the day. But once again, by the grace of God, I was able to survive that, being in that environment, surrounded by drugs. But like I said, when my mom told me that I wasn't going to be anybody out of life because of my surrounding, that made me get focused. I started putting everything away at the age of 17. I got out of the games. I become a man. My first baby was born at the age of 18. And so I, I was working at the restaurant. After I graduated from high school, I opened up my first business called, it was a upholstery shop, Jameson and Associate. That put me on the road to entrepreneurship because I was working in the upholstery shop as a pillar stuffer for two years to I learned the, the, the basic part of upholstery. I never mm -hmm. went to school for it, it was hands-on training. I opened that poultry shop up at the age of 19 years old, working for a, another man, gave me an opportunity to come into his establishment and, and stuff pillows and allow me at the age of 22 to rent space in the back of his building and start my own business at the age of 22 years old. I've been oh. so blessed in that environment and that geared me to get to medical school at the age of 22. So I enrolled into a medical program at the University of Tennessee at the Baptist Memorial Hospital. Uh, Baptist at, at that point in time had a tuition reimbursement program. That allowed me to connect the upholstery shop with the medical industry. Mm -hmm. 
just ironic, I was blessed enough to pay my own way through medical school as an entrepreneur, as a kid that I've been through the abuse, the drugs, the, the homelessness and everything. When I say homelessness, it's because we didn't have a place to go when mom moved to my auntie Jenny house, right? Uh -huh. So I looked over all of those things that we went through and it put me on the path that I didn't want to disappoint my mother, number one. So I put down the drugs, the drinking, all the alcohol and things that we were doing. I got out of the gangs. I went and got me a full-time job. I got into a medical program and started, you know, excelling from that point forward. Um, after my 15th year in the medical industry, I opened up my own clinic. It was a pick line clinic for um, long-term illness for chemotherapy patient, heart disease, transplants patient, we call it the pick line. So it, in 15 years, I, I was a surgery assistant in surgery. Um, after five years of doing that, I signed on with a vascular medical surgery group, worked with that group for like another six years. I studied for a post anesthesia care unit as a, a PACU technician. Um, after I did that for a few years, I mean, like literally, I just started climbing the letters. I got my master's, my PA degree in surgery, my master's. Uh, I also have a PhD in health science, all through the University of Tennessee medical program. Well, we are just so delighted that you are a survivor and that you can help empower others to have going through the same situation. Unfortunately, Dr. Jameson, we're kind of running out of some time here, but what I'd like for you to do is to share with our viewers and our listeners, if someone wants to reach out to you for help, how can they find you in any books or anything that you have that will help someone else? Can you share that with us? We got roughly about four minutes, three minutes to do that in. Yes. Okay. First and foremost, you can, you can find me through Robert L. Jameson on social media, Dr. Robert L. Jamison on Facebook, on Twitter, Dr. Robert Jamison. You can also find my clinic on Google or anywhere, alternativehealthcarela.com, alternativehealthcarela.com. Uh, you can look at some of the services that we offer in the behavior and the mental health in terms of, um, you know, and I, I got into that field because I wanted to be able to help people that's going through those processes that I went through. So alternativehealthcarela.com. My phone number is 213-258-5112. Um, my book is called The Turning Point. You can find that book on amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, or you can go to Meet Robert. Ljameson.com. And you can find out a whole lot of information about me on meetrobertljameson.com. You can find out a lot about me in the medical industry if you go to alternativehealthcarela.com. And so those are some of my handles on social media and on the World Wide Web on Google. Well, we certainly thank you for your willingness and spending your time today with us here on A Place Call through sharing your testimony and your story uh, how you survived the very storm of your life. And we know that your story is going to help someone else as they are going through that same thing, a place call through. Again, I thank you for being my guest here today. I had a place call through, sharing the story here on WYTV7 Community Broadcasters Network. I have been your host, Patricia Wade Goings. I am evangelist, life coach, and author of Willpower, The Call to Rise Above. If you have a story, and you want to share those inspirational moments with us, please reach out to me, pgoings, wp at gmail.com. You may also reach me in area code of 843-608-9744. You may follow me on my website at www.willpowerthecalltorizeabove. Again, I look forward to hearing from you with your story of inspiration. Again, it has been my pleasure and my honor, Dr. Jameson, to have had you as my guest here today at a place call through. Remember, sow those seeds, help us continue with our mission of hope. Have a wonderful day.